bulletin is your take-home work of Mark chapter 6, and I invite you to take it out and take it home so you can go deeper this week in this gospel. Also is another celebrating life together of another uh, family that has joined our church in the last year so that you understand why people are joining and how they're getting involved. Uh, so take a moment and read through that uh, sometime today. I have a favor to ask of you. <clears throat> Two weeks from tomorrow, I'm going to leave for a week to go do sermon planning for all of 2016. Every year I do this, and I try to line out all of our sermons for the whole following year with outlines of each sermon and what we're doing. The way I do that is I spend an enormous amount of time in quiet and prayer, but I also love getting ideas from you, the congregation. What are things that we need to be addressing or preaching about, topics or scriptures that you want to hear about? And what I do is I compile all those together, and during that week away, I pray through them. And oftentimes what happens when lots of people share ideas. There's continual ideas that come up, which is apparent that we need to address it. So I'd invite you to email me uh, or write me a note of ideas that you have that would help me in terms of leading us in 2016 and what we're preaching on here at Central Union. So will you commit to doing that? The correct answer is yes. Okay, just checking. And so my email address is in the bulletin uh, if you don't know that one. Uh, And so I'm looking forward to that time and praying for our church and what God is doing among us and will do. And so I would also ask and invite you to pray for me during that time as I try to discern what we're doing uh, in this year ahead. So would you pray with me now as we begin our sermon time together? Our God, we are a thankful people for you have called us sons and daughters. We are thankful because you've given us these scriptures to inspire us but also to help us to question ourselves. Today, would you come and allow us to have the willingness to hear these scriptures afresh. Grant us the courage to be disciples for this world of ours today, and grant us the heart that we need to follow your call. For it's the name of Jesus, our Christ, that we pray. Amen. We live in a land marked by laws, The laws are for the common good of that which we should do or shouldn't do. But every once in a while, some laws get on the books that kind of make you go, huh? And so I wanted to share a few of the laws of Hawaii that may make you go, really? So first law, you will be fine for riding in the back seat of a passenger car without a seat belt, but you can ride in the back of a pickup truck without any safety equipment, and that's okay. Anyone else find that bizarre? I can be in a car and be fine for not having a seatbelt, but I can sit in the back of a pickup and not have any problems with that. Another law, for some of you this may be known and others it may not, by law you may only have one alcoholic drink in front of you at a time. Did you know that? By law, if you have two, naughty, naughty. Third, it is illegal to appear in public wearing only your swimming trunks. Think about that for a minute. It is illegal for you to be in swimming trunks on our island, at the beach. Anyways, this is, I'm sure, a concern of you. It is illegal to own a mongoose without a permit. And last one, coins cannot be placed in your ears. That's illegal here in our great land. Apparently, it's a big problem with people putting coins in their ears around this place. But there is one law that I think makes great sense, and it says this. Any person who in good faith renders emergency care without compensation or expectation of compensation at the scene of an accident or emergency to a victim of the accident shall not be liable for any civil damages because of it. The phrase that it's most often termed as is the law of the Good Samaritan. The law of the Good Samaritan has become enculturated in our culture. 
Every state has the law of the Good Samaritan. This biblical text that we are looking at today has influenced so many people to, in order for us to be inspired to be a people of assistance, of care, of help. See, laws aren't anything new in our day and age. Laws have always been around. And the people of Israel had 613 laws that they followed. It was called the Law of Moses. And of these 613 laws, many of them had to do with how they were to worship God, but also how they do life together. And so some of the laws were kind of silly, like you should not eat shellfish, or don't wear clothing of mixed fibers. But some of them were about how do we make whole broken relationships? How do we ensure that God is the one who we worship instead of the things of this world? And so the Israelites were a people of law. But what we've learned in the Israelite people and even today is that you can't legislate love. You see, the law of the 613 are summarized in a very simple law. We call it the great commandment. Love God with your whole being and love each other in the same way. And so this law of love is that which we're invited to live out daily among us. But we can never legislate this law. It's something that we choose to live by. And so this parable today that we're exploring is this interesting parable because it actually is a shock to the Israelites. It's an affront to them. It's actually a slap in the face of the religious community. Did you get it? In the ancient world, there were two groups called the Samaritans and the Israelites. And the Israelites hated the Samaritans. They saw them as a lesser kind of people, as not as good as, and certainly not as capable of, being God's people. 700 years before Jesus' appearance on the scene, a split happened. And I want to read a little history about the Samaritans. Samaritans were descendants of a mixed population occupying the land following the conquest of Assyria in 722 BCE. They opposed the rebuilding of the temple that was destroyed in Jerusalem and constructed their own place of worship. They were seen as ceremonially unclean, socially outcasted, and as religious, they were considered heretics. The Samaritans were the very opposite of the religious community of the Israelites. And so Jesus is interacting with this religious expert, this one who is an expert in the law, and he's questioning Jesus, how do I achieve this eternal life kind of thing? And Jesus asks him, well, what do your scriptures say? And by this point, they had summarized all of the scriptures of the law of Moses and love God and love others. But then he tries to trick Jesus. Who is my neighbor? You see, the Israelites had a belief that their neighbor was their kinship, their community, the Israelites. Those were the neighbors that they were called to be kind and gracious and forgiving to. But the Samaritans, no, the Samaritans were those others, those outside of our, our silo, outside of our box, and we should never, ever interact with them, let alone see them as equals to us. So when the guy asks, who is my neighbor, Jesus insults the religious scholar by talking about this story of a Samaritan that we call good. You see, in that world, a good Samaritan is an oxymoron. They don't go hand in hand. And in fact, the priest and the Levites are seen as these really noble, high-ranking people in the religious culture of that time. And so the expectation would be that the priest and the Levite would be right and the Samaritan would be wrong. But instead, Jesus turns it upside down and says that the religious people miss the point of the law of love even though they follow every law. What happens when we follow the laws of God but actually miss the point of them? What happens when we start making classes of people of good or bad, that we're better or worse, that there's some kind of pecking order in God's kingdom, 
we are confronted by scriptures like this of a good Samaritan who does the unthinkable. So I want to unpack this parable in its fullness this morning by using a mission statement. If everyone would grab your bulletin out and turn to the front cover of your bulletin. Since I got here, we've been wrestling with why do we exist as a community of faith? And in May, we as a community of faith gathered together in our annual meeting and voted unanimously to adopt a mission statement that would guide us in how we use our resources, what we focus on, and where we go as a community of faith. And I want you to read it with me because this is the mission of Central Union Church. Shall we read it together? We engage and embrace all as we seek to embody Christ. We engage and embrace all as we seek to embody Christ. And so we're going to use this as a map to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. The first major word in that sentence is engage. Engage is this idea that there's some kind of interaction between two people. It's this invitation to meet people where they are in life, and not just some people, but all people as we engage them. So we have the priest and the Levite. The priest and the Levite are really important people in the notion of worship. The priest was the leader of the worship community. The Levite was the helper in that worship community. There are very strict laws in Mosaic law that said that they could not be unclean and continue to do their priestly functions. So how does one get unclean? Well, one is, is that you touch a dead person or you touch someone that is bleeding. And so how did this priest and Levite engage the one on the road who'd been left for dead? Did they stop where they were going and bend their knee to help? No. They literally crossed to the other side of this road and passed by. Have you ever seen people do that in real life? Where we see something that we think might be unsafe or unknown, and we either literally cross the streets or do it in our head, where we try to get away from those others. But then the Samaritan comes along on his journey, and he doesn't cross the road. Instead, he comes and bends a knee. And notice this one is in need. That road, the road to Jericho, was one of the most dangerous roads in the ancient world. It was marked by these cliffs and these cavities in these cliffs in which people could hide and bandits would constantly rob people and beat them and leave them for dead. The Severian didn't know if that one was injured or if it was a bandit playing possum. But he stopped. And he engaged him. Do you see the difference between these two responses to the need in front of them? One is to pass it by, and the other is to stop and engage it. Second word, embrace. What does it look like to embrace? Well, of course, the Levites and the priests can't embrace because they kept on going. But this one, the Samaritan, he stops and notices that he's hurt. And he immediately begins to bandage him and put oil as an ointment or salve on this guy to try to bring healing to his body. He embraces him by picking him up off the ground and putting him up on his donkey so that they can go to the next town to get help. And he doesn't stop there. He doesn't dump him at the door. Instead, he goes in and offers two denarii, two days worth of wages, and says, here's the beginning of what I will pay to make this man whole. I have to do go and finish my work, but I will be back, and when I come back, I will pay the difference so that he can become whole. Wow. Now that's what embracing looks like. That's quite a high calling, isn't it? That we go beyond ourselves in order to bless another. Martin Luther King Jr. said this. The first question which the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the good Samaritan reversed the question and said, if I do not stop to help this man, 
what will happen to him? Often we live in this world where we play church. We play Christian in which we have all the right things to say and we know the laws, but we never actually live by them. That we never live by the law of love. For we go through life asking, well, how will it impact me? Versus asking the deeper question, how will it impact them? This faith of ours is a faith that we are called to mature, to become growing ups to become the sages. And age never matters in the Christian faith. Did you hear that? Just because you're older than another does not mean that you are more mature in the way of Jesus Christ. Because I could be with a 10-year-old or a 50-year-old or a 90-year-old who asks, what's in it for me? And that is not maturity. Maturity asks, what's in it for them? How may I help another? How may I bless them? So we're invited into seeing this scripture in a deeper way. Not because the Samaritan is inherently good. No, in fact, the Samaritan is seen as this other, this non-existing person, this one who would never do anything good, who teaches the religious ones how to embody the way of Jesus Christ. Embody. It's the invitation to you and to me in this Christian faith to look like little Jesuses in our world. At the end of this parable, Jesus asks, which one is the neighbor? And the religious expert must say, the Samaritan. The Samaritan is the one. And Jesus responds, go and do likewise. Yesterday was an interesting day around here. Fifty women are gathered even today up in, at camp, retreating together on a women's retreat. Growing deeper in faith and connecting with each other. And hopefully they'll come back to inspire us anew. Yesterday morning, our church gathered with three other churches in the community as a first step to hopefully helping this homeless situation that we find ourselves in. And so people could come and get medical care and clothing and toiletries and food, but most of all, hope. And the question becomes of us, how do we continue to equip people to get out of homelessness and have whole lives again? Then last night, we had a movie on the lawn right out here in which we watched Paddington. Have you ever seen Paddington, the little bear? It's adorable. We had some church families, and we had a lot of people from around the community, and what was so neat was to watch our church families interacting with those that showed up, inviting them to come into worship and experience what they experience here as a part of this community of faith. You see, they were engaging and embracing and embodying last night, and yesterday morning, and on a retreat, and this week at weddings, and this week at a funeral at the thrift shop. You see, we're called to live this out out of the law of love, that we do it because we're inherently called to be a loving people. And I guarantee you, it's not always easy to follow that call. For it's much easier to resort back to religiosity, if that's a word, in which we know all the right things to say and the right people to be around, but we never actually live it in our lives. What does it look like in our day and age to embody Christ with each other? For me, it's about a covenant, the ancient biblical word of covenant, that just as we welcome new members into the covenant of membership, you and I are in covenant with one another and with God to support each other and to pray for each other, to lift each other up when we're down and to celebrate each other when we're up. We're committed to each other as a community of faith. So today, my hope is that you'll make two commitments as a part of this community of faith. Number one is that we as a people follow the law of love that seek to make an impact and transform lives by living this faith of ours. In a few moments, we're going to sing a great hymn 
They will know we are Christians by our love. And love isn't an emotional thing, it is an action thing. How we live our lives exemplifies the kind of love that we believe in. And secondly, we as a community of faith pull out our golden tickets that you'll find in your pew rack in front of you and that today is Commitment Sunday that we commit to each other but most importantly to God to support the mission of this church because we now know what it is to engage and embrace all as we seek to embody Christ. And we're going to invite you to fill it out or if you've already done that, to bring up a blank one and put it into the calabashes in the front as a sign and a symbol that you are partnering with each other and with our God to accomplish the mission among us. You see, we need every hand in the boats to be rowing, to get to where we need to go. And I believe of what we saw last year and what we're seeing this year, that you all are hearing it and heeding that call and leading the way. My wife and I filled this out already, and so we're putting in a blank one because we made a commitment on the first day that we're in this boat with you. And my hope is that you will make a commitment as well. And so in the moments that follow, Margaret's going to play the chorus of our hymn that we will sing. And in a few moments, we'll sing together the hymn that's found in your bulletin. And so may one and all of you come and commit to God and to each other this morning.